Thank you very much for having me. And I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, be able to share my passion, um, and uh, which is lifestyle medicine and how it relates to heart disease. And uh, one of the things I ended up doing more recently is getting board certified in uh, lifestyle medicine as well. And so I'll talk a lot about my journey uh, and how all that relates to uh, heart disease and what we're gonna go through here today. So I'm sharing my screen here. All right, there we go. So um, yeah, I, I again, appreciate this opportunity. It's kind of a, an amazing adventure that I've been through in my life, which has brought me here today, spreading the power of lifestyle medicine, plant-based nutrition and everything in regards to how it affects heart and cardiovascular disease. So. I'll share that whole story, some of the things I've learned uh, along the, uh, my journey, some crazy things that's happened to me in my life that really has emphasized all these important concepts. I do need to start by making a slight apology for two reasons. Number one, I am on call right now. There may be a possibility I'll have to check my phone and message uh, back and forth. And you may hear some construction noise because I am here at, at the hospital right now and they have a bunch of construction projects going on. Hopefully those interruptions will be minimal and we could focus on what's important, which is learning about lifestyle medicine and heart disease. And I do think this picture is the perfect way to think about lifestyle medicine and heart disease. Uh, you have two different roads you can go. The typical American takes the road on the right there where it's just pills and procedures. But on the left is lifestyle changes with a predominantly or exclusively plant-based diet, exercise, and lots of other things. And honestly, as we all know, the most powerful thing to do for any medical illness is to treat the cause of the problem. It's just common sense. Unfortunately, that's just not the way our healthcare system is set up at this point in time. So in order to really get into this and, and talk about it, I'd like to start a little bit with my personal journey uh, and how, how things have gone for me. This was me back in 2014, almost 100 pounds heavier. I was uh, following the standard American diet and starting to suffer from a lot of standard American diseases. Of course, not just obesity, but sleep apnea, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. I had a lot of palpitations. Uh, I had back pain issues and horrible acid reflux. And uh, it was really, I had an aha moment when I was walking up a flight of stairs one day and I couldn't breathe and my heart was pounding. And I said, geez, I got to do something about this. I'm only 34 years old. I have six kids and I need to really be around for them. And at the same time, I was getting frustrated because this was my medical practice, pill, 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 pill. It's pretty much all I did was prescribe medications, order tests and tell people when they needed heart surgery. And I realized quickly people didn't like the pills. They had side effects, they cost money. And ultimately, even if I gave my patients all the proper medications as, in, as dictated in the guidelines from the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology, all the right medicine still wouldn't necessarily prevent a heart attack or a stroke or their heart disease from progressing. So I was like, I knew something was missing, but I didn't quite pinpoint it until my own personal health issues came right full, full blown right at me. And it coincided perfectly with my frustrations as a physician, a practicing cardiologist, seeing how people didn't like the medications, how they didn't work all that great. So I said, all right, I'm going to get my life in order. I'm going to really take control of things. And then I realized I had no clue what to do. I wasn't trained in this, right? Doctors don't learn nutrition. Our idea of prevention in the medical world is pills, right? Giving cholesterol meds, blood pressure meds, diabetes meds, aspirin. Uh, our concept of prevention in our world, when I was trained, was, uh, was medications, not eating healthy, exercising, losing weight. So I made a ton of mistakes, which I share a lot with my patients. Number one, thinking exercise was the key. Exercise is not the key. It's maybe 20% of being healthy, 80% is the food. And I'll tell you some crazy stories about that coming up. The other misconception is thinking chicken and fish were good for, for me and eating low fat dairy products and putting olive oil all over everything. And this is kind of what a more Mediterranean style diet can be like sometimes what the USDA dietary guidelines recommend. And I made the mistake of reading that document thinking the government's not gonna lie to me, right? Government's gotta be telling me the truth, but you know what? It's a lot of industry influence on there. And so- that's another mistake that I made that I really try. And then, you know, I still ate unhealthy foods in moderation. Of course, I didn't want to give up the burgers, the fries, the, the ice cream. I just cut back. And I soon learned 
things that are bad for you shouldn't be done in moderation, right? You shouldn't smoke cigarettes in moderation. You shouldn't do heroin and cocaine in moderation. Things that are bad for you should be zero. But just like cigarettes, heroin, and cocaine, this stuff here, the standard American diet is very addictive. It's like a drug. Sugar is like a drug. It's not just easy to snap your fingers and give it all up. So it is a challenge. But what really hit me was when I watched Forks Over Knives, the documentary talking about plant-based diets and their power to prevent and reverse heart disease. And I thought it was propaganda. I thought, no way, it's real. This can't be legit. Uh, I was actually angry. I remember uh, almost yelling and screaming out loud, thinking, why didn't I not know this when I first learned about plant-based diets? Because I thought you had to eat meat to live and, and, and such. And I, you know, I when I researched it on my own and I looked at all the medical literature, reviewed things, and it's legitimate that really at least 80%, and most experts think thinks around 90% of heart disease is preventable through the proper lifestyle. And I was thinking, why the heck was I not trained in this? This should be the main thing I'm focused on. This should be all my training, not just pills, surgeries, and procedures, but that's just not the way our medical system works. So I ended up taking you know, my own health into my own hands, changing my diet to a whole food plant-based diet that was low in fat and uh, exercised. And I continued with the exercise, ran some marathons, lost a hundred pounds. And uh, man, I tell you, it changed my life quite a bit. And now my passion is just so strong to share the power of lifestyle medicine and try to be part of the change in regards to our healthcare system and the way we approach these things. And the change is coming. It's just a very slow change, like everything in our world, unfortunately. And I want to do everything I can to get it to speed up. Everybody's hoping, oh, let's just wait for artificial intelligence to solve all of our medical problems, right? Yeah. You know, that's not really a great idea. We have the solution now. We just need to be able to enact the change, change our culture, our food system, healthcare system, and government policies. And we'll talk about that. So what we'll do here today is we'll talk about the current state of healthcare in the United States briefly, which as you may know, is not very great. Uh, we'll do a little quick crash course on nutrition. We'll talk about prevention and reversal of heart disease and our whole lifestyle medicine concepts about, you know, about how we make sure that you don't have a heart attack and you don't clog your arteries up with plaque. And then uh, things that you can do to kind of top it all off. And along this way, I'll share some stories and some crazy interesting things. Uh, to kind of make it um, more memorable and, and uh, really kind of drive the points in that we need to learn and, and take out of this uh, today. So you guys may know this, heart disease has been the number one cause of death in the United States for more than 100 consecutive years. The last time heart disease was not the number one killer was 1918 when it was the Spanish flu. CDC just came out again with uh, the data for last year, 2022, still heart disease killed 700,000 Americans. That is more than the number of American soldiers that died in combat in all wars in American history combined ever just last year, heart disease deaths. Mind blowing considering how preventable heart disease is. This is how many people die. And when you look at it in perspective, heart and circulatory disorders, which includes stroke, this is how big it is compared to things like war, pregnancy and birth complications, murder and suicide. So look at the perspective, not that we should ignore suicide, murder, and, and those other things, but just we need to put more emphasis on heart disease and stroke, especially because we already have the solutions to the problem. Why is it that we're not doing more about it? And I'll share some insight there. We do have a cure for heart disease, nearly 100% preventable and potentially even reversible, but we need to really act on this. And, you know, it's not just heart disease throughout this whole lecture series with the real truth about health. You'll learn about other things, stroke, diabetes, hypertension, dementia, autoimmune disorders, sleep apnea, osteoporosis. So many things are affected by lifestyle. It is insane how much money we spend. And that is the problem. Why do we let so many people die prematurely? I sum it down to two reasons, culture and money. Culture doesn't want to change. Who wants to give up their burgers, fries, and hot dogs and their standard American diet or their meat in general? And our culture is very sedentary. And money. There's no money in healthy people. There's not as much money in clean food, unfortunately, although obviously things are trying to change. And it's just really, really, you know, wrong that, that doctors get paid more the sicker their patients are. If my patient is so healthy, they don't need to see me. They don't need tests. They don't need to be hospitalized. But if my patient has heart attacks, and needs a bunch of procedures, guess what? I get to do procedures and I make more money. It is really a backward system, which is slowly shifting, but happening way too slow. We need to be the change and make this happen quicker. 
So we do live in a capitalistic society. I think back, if they went 100 years back and said, hey, how can we make a healthcare system that is based on making money? There's really only going to be two rules to that healthcare system. We don't want healthy people. If everybody's healthy, they're eating plant-based, they're exercising, not smoking, not drinking alcohol, they're thin, they sleep good, they're low stress, they're not going to need to see their doctors, they're not going to need medication, surgeries, and procedures. So rule number one, we don't want healthy people. Rule number two, we don't want dead people, right? So if you die, they can't make money off of you. So what ends up happening is we keep people alive, kind of, but they accumulate medications chronic diseases, need multiple doctor's visits, surgeries and procedures and diagnostic tests, kind of living longer, but are you living better? Absolutely not. And that's the screw up in our system. And it all comes down to the money aspect of it, which is wrong. $3.8 trillion were spent on preventable or on healthcare last year. And more than half of that Estimates say about 80% of that are for diseases that are preventable through lifestyle changes, including those related to heart disease, alcohol, drugs, even orthopedic issues from obesity and being overweight, which is all over the place in the United States. And our healthcare spending is way more than the rest of the world. You look at this top line here, the United States towers over every other country in regards to what percentage of our economy is healthcare spending. You would think with all that spending, we gotta be healthy, right? Man, we spend a lot of money in our health. Guess what? We are dead last in regards to life expectancy in industrialized nations. What's going wrong? It is the fact that we are not doing the right thing. We have expensive procedures. We spend more money on drugs in America than the rest of the world combined and don't focus on prevention adequately. So I thought really hard about this, of course, for years now. And I said to myself, was it really my fault that I was almost 270 pounds? My sister was 450 pounds in high school. My mom and dad were over 300 pounds. You know, I think we're smart people, we're nice people, but really, I don't think it's the fault of the individual person if they're in a bad situation because of poor lifestyle choices. What I always say is there's five main things that are behind all these, these issues. Number one is our human instincts, the sugar, salt, and fat cravings. We, uh, we This whole um, motivational triad of seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, and conserving energy. That's just the way we were evolved to not starve and die. And we still have those evolutionary human uh, tendencies, but right now we're not starving. We have plenty of food uh, and uh, it's really messed up. So is that the individual person's fault? Absolutely not. But it's something we need to overcome and can consciously overcome. The second is culture. As you know, that's a big barrier. When I was a kid, Halloween candy, man, it was breakfast, lunch, and dinner for me for a week after Halloween. And it was a lot of junk food and pizza and desserts and, you know, that's our culture. That's just the way we are. Is that my fault that I grew into that culture and became a food addict because that's what I was fed from childhood? Not the individual person's fault. The food industry, marketing to you, the candy bars at the register, right? And, and um, everything that they could do to make their food taste so good, so sweet, so salty, just to get you addicted. Uh, it's not the individual person's fault. The government policy is not subsidizing the proper healthy foods to make a healthy diet more cheap and more available, not the individual person's fault. And then the failure of our healthcare system is what embarrasses me the most is that we don't focus more on this. And again, it is shifting. It's just a slow shift and it's all stopped by the financial part of it. But they say by 2030, Medicare is gonna pay doctors and healthcare systems only for quality of care, not for quantity of care. So as that shifts, we're gonna to want to focus more on prevention, trying to stop the heart attacks and strokes from happening in the first place. So it is shifting, but this is why America is so sick and it's not really the individual person's fault. I mean, everybody knows they should eat healthy, exercise, all these things. But when you're born into the system with all these things, it's really hard to overcome. Some people are better at it than others, but we need to have the support there. We need to fight all these different things and make it as easy as possible for people to get healthy. Change the system. So the food system, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, pharmaceutical industry and the healthcare industry stops profiting off of the illnesses of good American people. And they need to start profiting on promoting good health and prevention. That's what we really need to do. Fighting the culture, and the money. This is the problem. And really the best way to, to fight it is you guys 
going out, speaking up, working hard, spreading the message, being a good example, showing people how easy it can be. Here's a good example of how this we really need to go. We need to shift away, of course, from the pills to the procedures. What we want is to get away from the acute care model where you just see your doctor for 10 or 15 minutes and the doctors get paid the more they see. We don't get paid for preventing disease. So they never talk to you about eating healthy or anything like that. We want a new system with longer appointments, an integrative approach where you just see, you see the doctor and a nutritionist and a, a behavior modification specialist or a life coach you know, a psychologist, if there's uh, those issues getting in the way of healthy habits, we need to not get paid for productivity. We need to focus on lifestyle and get paid for prevention. That's the way we want to shift our healthcare system. So really, when you, when you think about it right now, we use these stents, coronary stents, and all these articles here reference how coronary stents to treat blockages in the coronary arteries do not prevent heart attacks, do not make you live longer. So what the heck are we doing? The reason is they don't treat the cause of the problem, which we'll get to. We really need to focus on the cause. And so we have all these expensive, expensive treatments that have risks to them when we don't need to use them. We could use a lifestyle approach, and this has been very well validated. Every year goes by more being published about how powerful a lifestyle approach is. And so just to give you an example about what we do here, we do sometimes coronary artery stents to open up cholesterol, calcium blockages, atherosclerotic plaque blockages in the coronary arteries, or open heart bypass surgery, saw the chest open, take veins out of the legs and use some of the arteries to completely bypass where the clogging is, none of which treats the cause of the problem, but a lifestyle medicine approach does treat the cause of the problem, right? So about 1.2 million coronary stents per year, 1% of people die. That's about 12,000 people die as a complication from getting coronary stents. Uh, about 4% risk of the stent causing a heart attack during the procedure. So that's about 48,000 heart attacks we're causing every year through coronary stenting. Bypass surgery, it's about a half a million people get open heart bypass surgery every year. It's about a 3% uh, mortality, 3% of people die. So it's 15,000 people die as a complication of bypass surgery every year. And another 3% of people, 15,000 people have strokes as a complication of it. Guess what? When you take a lifestyle medicine approach to heart disease, you don't have any deaths. It doesn't kill you, right? No heart attacks, no strokes. It works very effective. You're treating the cause of the problem. We are not actively causing damage. Now, certainly, is it perfect? Can you be 100% heart attack proof? Probably not, but it depends on how far you go. It depends a little bit on your, your predisposition and such, but we can get people close to that 0% mark in regards to risk of heart attack, stroke, and dying from a heart or vascular issue if they do all the right things, which of course is a challenge. And that's the biggest criticism of a lifestyle medicine approach to heart disease is getting people to stick to it and stick to it lifelong. And the reason it's hard is because of our culture and our money and the human instincts and all those things. If we set it up to make it easy for people, a lot more people will be successful with this. And that is the biggest failure that we have. So now I wanna get into talking a little bit about the mechanism of heart disease, get some foundation so we can get into what to do to prevent it and even potentially reverse it. So the way I like to describe it, the way I think about it is we talk about our friends, the monkey and the rabbit. So the way I think about it is monkeys and rabbits out in nature, they have no coronary artery disease, no plaque buildup, no atherosclerosis whatsoever in their natural environment where they're eating a diet that was made for their bodies, a plant-based diet, they're staying physically active. They don't smoke cigarettes, at least I've never seen a smoking monkey or a smoking rabbit in the past. And you know they have completely clean coronary arteries in their whole system. However, if you bring these poor animals, and I don't obviously advocate animal testing, but researchers have taken these animals into the lab and fed them a diet high in cholesterol, high in saturated fats. And within months, just a few months, they severely clog their arteries and can induce heart attacks and strokes. Showing that if you give these animals a diet that's not natural for them, an animal-based diet, it can cause disease and cause these problems. But these researchers did something really amazing, a simple thing. And that's what I love about lifestyle medicine. It's really a simple concept. They took these animals after the arteries were clogged up, put them back in the nature, just gave them back their carrots and bananas and let them go about their business. And guess what happened? The clogging of the arteries reversed itself. And it kind of shows how the default state of the human body, it's been shown in humans as well, or the monkey body or the rabbit body, the default state is to be healthy. And the absolute key 
to prevention and reversal of heart disease is not necessarily a pill or a procedure. Remove the thing that's causing the harm to the body and the body will heal itself up on its own. Remove the processed foods, remove the animal products and you will heal up. And so that's the simple concept of lifestyle medicine is so powerful and it works so well. One of the analogies that I use is I kind of say, hey, if you took your took a knife, cut your hand and you did absolutely nothing, what's gonna happen? Your hand's gonna bleed, the cut will bleed, but your body will stop the bleeding. It'll eventually form a scab and form a scar. If you do nothing, it will heal up. However, if you wake up and you cut your hand every single day with a knife in the exact same spot, it can never heal because you continuously injure the same spot. While our arteries on the inside are no different than the skin on the outside. We continuously though, injure our arteries, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, tobacco use, secondhand smoke, all these other toxins that we get and it never gives the arteries the opportunity to heal up and reverse the disease like it needs to. So just remove the thing that's causing the harm. I have another exam analogy for that later on, and, and then the heart disease can reverse itself. So what we really need to do for the little crash course on nutrition is just simplify it as much as possible for everybody. Now, this audience may know a little bit more about this than others, but when you're explaining nutrition to other people, this is, I think, the best way to simplify it and talk it through. We just say there's three food groups. There's processed foods, there's animal foods, and there's plant foods. So processed foods are anything that has sugar, refined carbohydrates like white flour, white bread, white rice, white pasta, uh, or added fats. So processed foods uh, have white flour, sugar, or added fats and oils to them. Even olive oil is technically processed, right? So the key to knowing if something has a processed ingredients, just look at the ingredient list. If there's added sugar, which is about 50 different ways they can put sugar on the label, added oils, which also, you know, oils and lecithins and stuff, there's a gazillion ways they can put that on the label. Uh, or if there's like no fiber in something, you know, it's a refined type of carbohydrate. You need to avoid those at all costs. Like we said, don't just reduce it. Not in moderation should be eliminated. The second food group is the animal-based foods, red meat, white meat, fish, seafood, dairy products, cheese, anything that comes from an animal, eggs, that's an animal product. And then the third is whole unprocessed plant-based foods. Just think of it as these are the three categories. What we need to do is remove the processed foods, remove, or at least, at least dramatically, dramatically reduce the animal foods and focus on eating whole unprocessed plant-based foods. And really a lot of people, when I tell them this concept, they're like, well, what's left to eat? They're like, oh, geez, come on. There's only 100,000 something edible plant species out there, 200,000 uh, as fruits, vegetables, beans, lentils, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. And you know, when you think about the way most Americans refrigerator looks, it looks like a morgue, all these dead animals sitting in there and secretions and ovulations, which are the eggs. And it's just like, ah, it's not very pleasant. But when you change your diet, look how beautiful it could become with all the fruits and vegetables, the colors, the reason we see in colors is so we get attracted to these very nutritious, helpful food items. It is just so much more beautiful. And it's just a common sense approach to health and wellness. Over 200,000 edible plant species is absolutely insane. And I focus on telling people that, you know, focus on the fruits and vegetables. There's over 50 different types of beans and lentils, whole grains, nuts and seeds, herbs and spices, and it's beautiful. There's so much to do. We really need to focus on eating whole foods, unprocessed. So then you may ask, how do you define a whole food? And I tell my patients, no, not that type of a whole food. There was a donut company over by me that used to promote this, eat whole foods, H-O-L-E foods. It's like, no, man, that's like making fun of healthy eating is horrible. That's not the type of whole food that we're looking at. We define a whole food as something that doesn't have any harmful component added to it. There's no salt, no sugar, uh, no, you know, some type of ex extract or something that's processed and added to the product. There needs to be no healthful component removed. So they didn't take out the fiber is the biggest thing. Uh, so you don't want the, you want the whole wheat, not refined, you know, carbohydrate, wheat, flour, et cetera. Uh, you want the brown rice is better than, than the white rice. There are lots of examples of that. And uh, really you want it to be as minimally processed. Sure. Like tofu is a little bit processed, not devastating. If you have it every once in a while, same with pasta, whole wheat pasta or lentil pasta, it's processed a little bit, uh, but it's not massively processed. So you could have those things a little bit, just not like on a regular basis in large amounts. So that's how we define a whole food. And I always tell people it's important to distinguish between vegan, which can have a lot of those processed ingredients, a lot of the sugar, the oil, refined carbohydrates versus 
uh, whole food plant-based. You can make everything on a whole food plant-based diet that you normally eat on a standard American diet. There's just ways you have to modify things and it takes some work with the cooking. And unfortunately, again, culturally, it's harder to do this because restaurants don't have whole food plant-based, low-fat or oil-free foods for the most part. It's improving, but still a challenge. Uh, but there's ways you can make everything on this. The food is great. That's never a concern. So going back to heart disease now, after our little crash course, crash course on nutrition, something I need to always emphasize when I'm talking about heart disease and lifestyle medicine is how atherosclerosis starts in childhood. It is so important to realize this, that the sooner you get healthy, the sooner you get your health under control, the better you're going to be decades and decades later. It's never too late. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I've seen 90 year olds change their diet and do well. And, but it's still the earlier you do it, the better. When you're born, your arteries are nice and clean. There's no plaque on the inside there. But as young as the age of three, it is very well seen that a lot of three year olds have significant plaques starting to build up in their coronary arteries. This is maybe a 20 year old, 25 year old. And then eventually it could become advanced disease. And then boom, you can have a heart attack. A heart attack happens when plaque has built up slowly over many decades and then suddenly becomes unstable and a blood clot forms. And within minutes, the artery is 100% clogged. The blood flow is completely restricted and it can cause lots of issues, including sudden cardiac death. This is so important to understand. Prevention is the key. Absolutely. They've even shown, this is crazy, pregnant women, with genetic high cholesterol, when their LDLs are 300 or 400s, they can detect cholesterol fatty streak buildup in the unborn fetus in the mother's womb. That's how early this process starts in life. So getting your risk factors controlled and starting young is so important to build a good, healthy heart foundation for the rest of your life. So the other big thing is this whole heart attack, this blood clot that can form here, that could suddenly happen. You never know. You could have a 20 or 30% blockage, feel fine. You don't even know it's there because that's only minimal. That's not going to cause any symptom. And then suddenly you get this clot. It cuts off the blood supply. Boom, down you go. Heart attack. Somewhere around a quarter, one out of four to one out of three people, their first symptom of heart disease is sudden death. They just die. And I have heart disease in my family. I was unhealthy for a long time. My cholesterol was high. I was obese, all these things, blood pressure, everything. I never smoked, thank goodness, but I had a lot of secondhand smoke exposure. My mom smoked her whole life. And uh, I knew that I had to be careful here because I didn't want to be somebody that, you know, had a sudden cardiac arrest or, or a big heart attack like that. But it didn't really hit me until recently. And I've talked, I've preached this for years and years and years, how you want to prevent heart disease because you never know when you're going to be the one who just suddenly kills over and dies. And I've done good with things. And now my cholesterol is down quite a bit. I exercise, but after, like everybody, it's a struggle. I have my ups and downs like everybody. There's many barriers. There always seems to be something coming my way to motivate me more and remind me of how important it is and how precious life is and how, how really we need to focus on prevention. So this is what happened to me this past November. I was running the Monterey Bay half marathon in Monterey, California. My first half marathon since the pandemic, and at least the first in-person one, I've done some virtual ones. I was running with my two kids. They're teenagers. It was their first half marathon. This was going to be a great race, right? It's a beautiful place out in Monterey. Great scenic. It was a nice weather. I loved it. And so the race got out fine. And I didn't realize I was going to make two really good friends that day, unexpectedly. The man here on the left is Mr. Michael Heileman. He's a computer software engineer in the Bay Area. And the man on the right there is Gregory Gonzalez, a Supreme Court justice uh, judge in the uh, state of Washington. And we got to know each other very well. We're now good friends. And here is what happened. Greg, mile three, falls down right in front of me, just goes down. Uh, I could tell something was not right. He didn't, he didn't like stumble. He just boom, down he went and he hit his head on the pavement. He had a pool of blood behind his head. And oh my gosh, I rushed over to him and quickly saw he had no pulse. He wasn't breathing and started doing chest compressions. Thank goodness. Some people stopped and called 911. We were at an awkward part of the course. It took about six minutes for paramedics to get there hooked up a defibrillator. He was in a fatal rhythm called ventricular fibrillation, universally fatal, unless you shock the heart and get the rhythm back to normal. We applied a shock after doing all that CPR. 
His rhythm went back to normal. He woke up confused. What the heck am I doing here? And got him in the ambulance and away he went to the hospital. Knowing that he was in good hands and he was safe, I called the ER to give him a heads up as to what was happening, called the on-call interventional cardiologist to let him know. And I was a bit frazzled. And at this point, my kids are way in front of me. They're like, oh, dad's slow. What's going on? They didn't, they didn't know what was happening. I said, well, I might as well keep on going on this race. All right. So I kept going. And what happened? Right after the finish line, I was running behind this guy here, Michael Hylam, and the second guy. You could see me in the lower right corner behind so right after the finish line, here's a series of photos uh, that uh, courtesy of USA Today showing how he crossed the finish line here and he wasn't feeling well. He started getting dizzy. He kind of comes over, he grabs the side rail and then down he goes, full cardiac arrest. No pulse, hit his head, he was bleeding and I was right behind him. So there I am right there, started CPR. Within a minute or two, a volunteer brought a defibrillator. We hooked him up, ventricular fibrillation, fatal arrhythmia, shocked his heart really quick within a minute or two for Michael. And he woke up confused and he stopped his watch from his race. He's like, oh, I'm done with the race. Let me stop the watch. I need to get up. He says, we're like, no, man, you just died literally. And we got you back. Two runners in the same race right in front of me, both full cardiac arrest both successfully defibrillated. We got Michael into the ambulance. He went to the hospital. Once again, I called the ER. I called the interventional cardiologist. And they're like, you got to be kidding me. What, what's going on there? And both of them ended up having severe coronary disease, clogging in the left anterior descending, otherwise known as the Widowmaker. They both received stents, both made full recoveries. Absolutely crazy. So this got a lot of attention and we've been able to use this as a really great way to promote prevention uh, and learning CPR. But I have some comments about that in just a moment. We were featured on the Today Show where they had Michael and Greg meet each other for the first time. And then they uh, reunited me with them uh, for the first time as well. It was very emotional. It was wonderful. We talked things through. Uh, and I love to tell people now that both Greg and Michael are on plant-based diets and they're doing excellent. They plan on running the half marathon again with me this coming November. And of course, we're going to go very slow and they're cleared by the cardiologist already. And uh, we'll have defibrillators nearby, but they should be fine and safe. There should be no concern whatsoever with it. Uh, but I'm so proud of them for changing their diet and their lifestyle around. It was quite an amazing thing. And now we're using this opportunity as a way to really spread a positive message. Now, of course, the way our culture is and the way media is, you know, there's been a lot around about media and, and you know, a lot of controversy and such happening surrounding media. I see it myself. These guys are so awesome. They're helping to spread the positive message. But what happens is, get written up in Washington Post, New York Times, Runner's World, all these articles came out and guess what? Not a single one of them would mention a plant-based diet. Most of these didn't even mention healthy eating. All they wanted to focus on the miraculous recovery, how crazy the odds were. And yeah, it was crazy odds only in the size of the race that we were in, one out of 40 chance of a single person having a cardiac arrest. Two of them having a cardiac arrest in the same race, it's about one in 1600. Survival during a race, is only about 30% survival if you have a cardiac arrest during a race like this. 30%, both survived. And what are the odds of a cardiologist being right behind both of them? Absolutely crazy, right? So they focused all on that and they said, oh, everybody should learn CPR, which is great. Yeah, everybody should learn CPR, but isn't it better to prevent the cardiac arrest from happening in the first place? Both of these gentlemen had no symptoms before, no heart disease diagnosis before. They admitted to not eating the healthiest diet. Cholesterol numbers may not have been perfect, uh, but they felt great because they were exercising. And they were focusing on exercise. One of the mistakes I made was focusing just on exercise. Diet is 80% of health. Exercise is 20%. And so there was one news outlet, the um, Daily Mail. They'd like to be more controversial. So yeah, they talked a lot about um, about uh, healthy eating and plant-based diet and the activism that I've done on my YouTube channel and on my Facebook group. And the, here's a, the they even included in their article a uh, tweet from our protest in front of the McDonald's headquarters when they were giving out bacon for free. They got a lot of attention. And then, of course, um, one of the favorite things you guys can check out if you like was a podcast interview I did with the exam room podcast through PCRM talking all about this and three foods that your heart loves, which are beans, greens, and berries. Uh, check that one out. But I was so disappointed in how the media 
really wouldn't focus on the proper message, which is the prevention message. Now, the American Heart Association published articles on it, along with the whole Demar Hamlin story. And uh, in, our, in my situation, in my articles, they did mention the plant-based diet. It's actually in the guidelines from the American Heart Association. They have to mention it, right? Same with the American Medical Association. They mentioned it, which is great. But the news media, they won't, not at all. That's not what America wants to hear, part of our cultural problems. Quite an amazing story. This really tells me, geez, you know, we need to get checked out if you have risk factors, especially if you have symptoms. Focus on prevention early because you never know, even if you feel great on the outside and you can exercise and run a half marathon, you never know when something like this is going to happen to you. So life lessons really, really have, have continued day after day, seems like year after year, motivating me, inspiring me to continue to spread this message. So back to the message, here's the way I think about heart disease and how we can prevent and reverse it. There's two main components. There's other nuances and exceptions and such and rare instances, rare instances. But for the most part, the two things to focus on for heart disease prevention is getting your blood cholesterol numbers down and protecting your endothelium, the lining of the inside of the artery from damage at all costs. And it's so powerful. So the, the cholesterol concept uh, was very well, um, very well kind of written out here in this article called uh, It's the Cholesterol Stupid uh, by William Roberts. And really, you know, we know there's all these risk factors, you know, genetics, inflammation, cigarette smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, being overweight, being sedentary. Are any of them required to clog your arteries with plaque? And the answer is no. There is no research study that says you have to have high blood pressure, you have to have diabetes, you have to smoke cigarettes. No, you don't. But there is good, strong research to say that the one prerequisite that you must have to develop plaque buildup in your coronary arteries is an elevated LDL cholesterol. Other people use apolipoprotein B as a marker. Either one's fine. So basically, in other words, if your total cholesterol is low between 90 and 140, if your LDL is low, at least under 70, maybe in the mid-50 range, there is no evidence that smoking cigarettes, obesity, being sedentary, None of those things. There's no evidence that those things will clog your arteries up and contribute to heart disease risk if your baseline cholesterol numbers are so low. So again, you can say it as the prerequisite that you must have to develop plaque buildup is an elevated LDL cholesterol. So one of the main focuses on prevention is improving cholesterol, which of course is best done through diet. Yes, there's medications, which is a whole different long conversation that can be had. But diet is so much more powerful because it not only lowers your cholesterol numbers, but it also protects the endothelium from injury and inflammation. So you're really getting both of those major concepts just through one change. And so what increases your blood cholesterol levels? Well, eating cholesterol, eating saturated fats, and eating trans fats. So it's three things. And of course, which diet has no cholesterol and almost no saturated fat? and almost no pretty much trans fats. It is a whole food plant-based diet, which is what we use to prevent and reverse heart disease. And so knowing those numbers are so important. Most of the time you'll hear, oh, you want the total cholesterol under 200, you want the LDL under 100, but that's not good enough. That's not low enough, we need it lower. The Framingham study actually showed that 35% of people who had heart attacks had a total cholesterol between 150 and 200. So not low enough, it needs to be at least under 150, you know, preferably under 140 for your total cholesterol. And really there's this great, great uh, published article did this very complex statistical analysis talking about the impact of your blood cholesterol on cardiovascular health. And I summed it up here by taking one of their graphs and I put some animations over it to try to really portray the importance of LDL cholesterol and give you guys an idea statistically how important it is to get your LDL down over many years. So on the right side here, we have your cumulative risk of having a heart attack in percentage. So 1% starts here. This graph only goes as high as 16%. Down here is the age over time. And here is your cumulative LDL cholesterol exposure. How high is your LDL cholesterol over how many years is it elevated for? It's only elevated for one year, no big deal, but many people it's elevated for decades and decades and decades. So it's what we would call your cumulative LDL exposure. So when we think about the average American, right here in the middle, the average American has an LDL cholesterol of 125. If you remember what I said previously, we wanted at least less than 70 to be rock solid and prevent any plaque from building up. So if we think about the average American at the age of 40, their risk of a heart attack 
is 1%. At the age of 60, it's 4%. At the age of 80, it is off the charts at 16%. Not quite off the charts, but it's very high. 16% risk by the age of 80. And that's with an LDL cholesterol. It's only a little bit up, 125. That's the average American, right? Now, what about, I get a lot of people that come in and their LDL cholesterol is really high. It's around 160 or so. So you look at this graph, 160, where this line goes, by the age of 40, the risk is more around 3%. By the age of 60, the risk is around 16%. And by the age of 80, it's real high. It's like 50% risk of a heart attack by the age of 80 if your cholesterol numbers are that high. Now let's take it the flip side. Let's go around to somebody who actually did eat really healthy and do all the right things. They're on a plant-based diet. They've got the LDL down to say 60, which I was able to achieve when I went on Esselstyn's diet for a couple of months. I reached ideal body weight and my LDL dropped to 60 when it was as high as the 130s in the past. If you look at the statistics here with an LDL of 60 by the age of 40, under 1% risk by the age of 60, under 1% risk by the age of 80, still under a 1% risk. It's not 0% risk, but it's pretty darn unlikely to have a heart attack if you can get that LDL down as soon as you can in your lifetime. So the cumulative exposure to LDL is super crazy important as a concept. So we know that uh, LDL between 50 and 70 is really what we would call physiologically normal. That's where we need it to be. And we know that um, wild animals, wild primates and babies when they're born, that's where the LDL cholesterols are. Only if you introduce cholesterol and saturated fat, let them gain weight and do all these other things, then their cholesterol numbers start to go up, right? So what are optimal LDL cholesterol levels? Well, this is a graph. Each dot represents a major clinical trial and it shows what, where the LDL cholesterol was versus the risk of having a heart attack. And when we look at this, this is for primary prevention, people who've never had a heart attack. If you draw a line between all these dots and see what LDL cholesterol you need to get close to a zero risk, the number is about 55. So to get to about a zero risk of heart attack, your LDL needs to be around 55. And the sooner you get there and the longer it's there for, the better it's going to be. Now, what if you've already had a heart attack or stroke? These people are much higher risk, right? So we have a similar thing. Every dot represents thousands of people in clinical trials and the cholesterol is down here. The risk of having a heart attack or an event is over here. Well, once you've already had a heart attack or a stroke or a stent or a bypass, we call this secondary prevention. For secondary prevention, you need to go even lower. The LDL needs to be near 30. Now, the current guidelines actually have the recommendation being at around mid 50s, even for the highest risk people. But there's evidence that would say hmm, maybe a little bit lower is even better. So trying to get the LDL down is so important, no matter where you are in your heart disease uh, risk you know, journey. So really, the normal cholesterol numbers that we should be emphasizing is not less than 200, should be less than 150. The LDL should be at least less than 70, maybe better. We don't really worry about HDLs that much. It's more the efficiency of the efflux capacity of the HDLs that we're concerned about. And yeah, triglycerides, we like them to be low, but that's all through a lifestyle approach. Having them being slightly elevated isn't devastating as long as everything else is controlled well. So going back to our crash course on nutrition, how do we get our LDL cholesterol down? Well, don't eat the cholesterol, don't eat the saturated fats, don't eat the trans fats. And cholesterol only comes in animal foods. And we, there is no cholesterol in any plant-based food. And so just to common sense, eat a whole food, plant-based diet, it'll be cholesterol-free. There is no dietary requirement to eat cholesterol. It's not an essential nutrient. Your body can make it for you. Every cell in your body can make its own. So there's no need to bring it into your diet. And when we look at foods that are high in cholesterol, in many surveys, chicken is the number one source of cholesterol in the American diet. In a lot of other surveys, it's actually eggs, but look at chicken, how much cholesterol is in it compared to beef, almost the same. And uh, egg yolk is very high in cholesterol. And of course, eggs are the number one source. Butter is very high, but look at plant-based foods. There is no cholesterol in any plant-based food. So focus on eating unprocessed plant-based foods. Should we eat any cholesterol? This is the basic concepts here, super powerful statement from the National Academy of Medicine, used to be called the Institute of Medicine eat as little cholesterol as possible. Now, there was some confusing issues brought on by the egg industry in 2015 when they were updating the dietary guidelines. They tried to show the USDA, the all this research to say, oh, adding eggs to your diet, adding more cholesterol doesn't really affect your cholesterol numbers. Don't worry about it. And no, no, 
we do have to worry about it. They, they actually, of course, industry funded studies where they took people already ate a lot of cholesterol, gave them more cholesterol, said, look, it doesn't budget much. Well, that's silly. That's like taking people who smoke three packs of cigarettes and telling them to smoke a fourth pack and see how much the risk is going to increase. No, the important part is the first part that you do. So it's uh, the other analogy is it's like um, you smoke one joint. I never smoked marijuana, but I hear you smoke one joint and man, you get real high off of smoking one joint. But you smoke that second joint, eh, not much of an effect, right? Same thing with dietary cholesterol. You eat just a little bit, you could shoot your LDL up, but you add more to it, add another egg. Yeah, it doesn't go up that much more. So there was all this stuff. Oh, cholesterol is not a nutrition of concern, a nu nutrient of concern. Don't worry about restricting dietary cholesterol. And they were going to actually put that in the dietary guidelines. But all the major medical societies, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, lots of people were like, that's crazy. Controlled metabolic ward feeding studies where they locked people in and controlled everything that they ate clearly showed that even little bits of dietary cholesterol can increase your LDL cholesterol numbers. So they went in 2015 from the statement, cholesterol is not a nutrient of concern. They never published that officially in their recommendations. They changed it over to individuals should eat as little dietary cholesterol as possible while consuming a healthy eating pattern. And of course, what do lifestyle medicine physicians interpret that as? Zero. You don't need cholesterol. Eat none. Eat a plant-based diet. We shouldn't eat any, any amount. And I've seen this in my patients. I've had patients who are like, why is my LDL still 120? Why is it still 120? I eat a plant-based diet. Well, I'm doing everything you say, Dr. Loma. All right, let's go through your food log and see. Like, wait a second. You're eating three eggs a week. And that's the only animal food that they eat is three eggs a week. And they're like, well, well, yeah, I mean, I guess so. That's not a part of a plant-based diet. I'm like, no, that's not plant-based. An egg is not plant-based. Take it out. Let's repeat your lipids in a month. And then boom, their LDL drops to 70 or less. And it's just that little amount of cholesterol. Some people are hypersensitive to it. It can be that way. So just a little bit of cholesterol can raise the LDL, but there's variability. This is why this is confusing. It's confusing because of that whole concept of the initial cholesterol is the important part, not adding extra cholesterol, which confuses a lot of the data. A lot of it's uh, industry uh, sponsored. And the other confusing part is, is there's a lot of variability individually. About 30% of people are super sensitive to it. 50% moderately, 20%, you know, they can eat all the cholesterol they want. It barely changes their numbers. So that's another thing that kind of confuses this whole concept because you may hear some people say, oh, don't worry about eating cholesterol. No, no, you definitely need to worry about eating cholesterol. Don't eat any if you can. Eat as little as possible. Make sure your LDL is down. If your LDL is up, you're eating too much cholesterol. Try to get it zero if you can. Same thing really for saturated fat, not an essential nutrient. And certainly in those controlled metabolic ward feeding studies, saturated fat was more important than dietary cholesterol. It was more profound of an increase of LDL compared to dietary cholesterol. Butter is very high in saturated fats. Cheese is the number one source in America of saturated fat. Red meat is very high, even chicken, even if it's boneless skinless chicken breast has some. Coconut oil, palm oil, very high. And even coconut oil, even those plant-based saturated fats raise LDL. They're not good for cardiovascular health. And really, when you look at plant-based foods, essentially no saturated fats. Now, there will be some in oils, of course, even if they're plant-based like olive oil. And there will be some in nuts and seeds, avocados, there's little bits of, uh, you know, little, little amounts in there. And that's why the Ornish diet and the Esselstyn diet, which are the strictest diets, really, really eliminate or dramatically, dramatically restrict nuts and seeds because they want you to get as little saturated fat as you can to drive your LDL down as low as you can. So just like cholesterol, there is no safe amount of saturated fats, trans fats, or dietary cholesterol. And this, again, is a statement from the Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine, that any intake of cholesterol, any intake of saturated fat, any intake of trans fats above 0% of energy, any amount, will raise your LDL cholesterol, any amount. So there's no safe amount, just like there's no safe amount of smoking. Any amount can harm you. So as long as your LDLs are low, you're doing fine with your diet. But if it's high, you need to make sure you're restricting or eliminating cholesterol, saturated fat, and trans fats. Just like smoking cigarettes, there's no safe amount, should be zero, right? So that's the LDL cholesterol concept. Now we move to protecting our endothelium at all costs. And the endothelium is a single lining of cells right here, very fragile, very important for us to make sure that we protect it at all costs because any little damage uh, can cause inflammation and eventually lead to cholesterol plaque building up in there. So what we really need to do is no matter what, no matter what we can is, is keep 
the uh, keep those the endothelium nice and healthy. And the way I like the analogy I'd like to use here, which I alluded to earlier, is thinking of the process that damages the endothelium as you know inflammation. It is inflammation, right? It's an inflammation process clogging your arteries. Look at the word inflammation. It's in flame. So just think about the endothelium being on fire. So your arteries are on fire. Uh, if they're inflamed, if you're doing the wrong things, if you're smoking cigarettes, secondhand smoke exposure, eating processed foods, animal-based foods. And again, there is individual variability. Some people are more prone to inflammation from different food groups than others. It's a little hard to tease out, but we could use C-reactive proteins and some other uh, inflammatory markers to help determine these things. But this is the way we got to think about it. So if your arteries are on fire, if you got the inflammation going on, you don't want to ever do anything to pour gas on that fire. You don't want to fuel the inflammation. Animal products, oil of any kind, refined carbohydrates, the caffeine thing is a little bit controversial, maybe a small percentage of people, uh, probably not that big of a deal. Uh, but saturated fats, tobacco, and secondhand smoke, you don't want those things to fuel the flame and cause the inflammation because if the endothelium is inflamed and your blood cholesterol numbers are up, that's when the plaque is going to accumulate. What you want to do is pour water on it, right? You want to do the things that are going to help the endothelial function. The proper foods that really help promote good health and are anti-inflammatory help the natural nitric oxide release to help keep the arteries healthy. Fruits, vegetables, beans, lentils, whole grains, herbs, and spices. Guess, guess what these are? These are unprocessed plant-based foods, right? So that's what we need to focus on. But here's the issue. We get a lot of people who eat the good, healthy fruits, vegetables, beans, lentils, are eating a lot of plant-based foods, but then they're also eating a lot of the unhealthy foods, right? Um, so what we always do now in our medical world is we try to give pills to lower blood pressure, cholesterol, you know, anti-inflammatory stuff, whatever, but don't necessarily remove the harmful things that are causing the problem. The whole concept of lifestyle medicine, just like stop cutting your hand with a knife, let the body heal up, stop pouring the gas on the flame and guess what happens? Now you're only pouring water on it and the fire will go out. So that's a simple analogy. It is as powerful as that, it's as simple as that. That's what I love about lifestyle medicine and heart disease reversal and prevention. It's so simple, it's common sense, it's intuitive. I just wish it was easier for people to do and it was embraced more to make it easier for our culture the way it is, it's, it's a challenge. And really, like I said, moderation doesn't work. It only takes one meal one problem, and you can end up causing some endothelial injury. And there's crazy stories of people on plant-based diets, and they went out one time and they splurged. And during that splurge, they caused some endothelial injury and some inflammation and it triggered an event. Those are anecdotes, of course, who knows if one meal really can have that much of an impact, but it's possible. When you look at this shot from this picture from the Game Changers documentary, showing a blood sample after eating a low fat plant-based meal versus a higher fat animal-based meal, meal. And you can just see the fat in, in the blood sample versus how nice and clear and clean this is. There's just so much fat going through the system causing endothelial injury, it's crazy. So that's why a whole food plant-based diet is so important, focusing on getting your cholesterol numbers down and focusing on protecting your arteries uh, at all costs. And this is where I tell you that I lied to you. Earlier in the presentation, I told you heart disease was the number one killer in America, right? Well, maybe if you look at individual diseases, it is, but really heart disease is not the number one cause of death. The number one cause of death is diet. This is the burden of disease uh, study, which was uh, a big study showing the things that we can avoid in order to you know, prevent a premature death. Dietary risks were the number one preventable thing that we can do. So we should really not say that heart disease is the number one killer. We need to say the truth and speak it the right way. Our diet and our lifestyle is the number one killer in America. And you've heard this before maybe, but the analogy is, is this, it's tobacco. A long time ago, people thought smoking was good for you, good for your lungs, good for your heart, all this stuff is promoted by doctors, advertised, marketed, all these things. And it took so much time before the research finally was obvious and clear and the Surgeon General put a warning on there. They used to promote it to people who smokes, uh, who are pregnant. You know, this is one that Dr. Greger likes to show, blow in your face and she'll follow you anywhere. This is absolutely ridiculous, but the current state is actually how it relates to food. Now, 
man, I tell you the smoking a long time ago was a big deal, right? So doctors used to smoke in the hospital. They would actually give patients tobacco and cigarettes in the hospital when they were admitted, which is just crazy when you think about it, right? Absolutely mind boggling. I have a patient who was treated at Cleveland Clinic by a famous Dr. Sohn's cardiologist who developed a technique called the Sohn's technique where they go into the artery in the arm and that's how they access the heart to do an angiogram and look at things. And so he ended up uh, getting an angiogram by Dr. Sohn's. And I was like, oh, let me see the scar. Let me take a look and see. And I was looking at it as I'm, oh my gosh, that's a Dr. Sohn's scar. It's a, he's a legend. I can't believe it. And he, and, he, and, he, and he laughed and he said, oh, guess what else? See this right next to my scar? That's the burn wound from when Dr. Sohn's dropped his cigarette on me during the surgery. During the surgery, this famous Cleveland Clinic cardiologist dropped a cigarette on my patient and burned him. That's the way it used to be. Now you fast forward to today. Okay, tobacco's out. They can't sell tobacco in hospitals. But now it's sugar and it's processed foods and it's animal-based foods. I have had many times where I've had people after heart attacks being served bacon and sausage and eggs and red meat in the hospital. It's in the cafeteria. I mean, we used to do our conferences. It would be pizza, soda, and potato chips. That's what they were, you know, feeding the trainees. And still to this day, I go to, like, I went to a big lipid conference about cholesterol management and the lipidologists were eating steak. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. And it's just people foo-foo off the diet because they don't want to change their diet. Not that they don't necessarily understand that there's a risk to eating red meat, saturated fat and cholesterol and endothelial injury and all these things that we talked about, but the culture is so ingrained in their head. That's the way they were raised and they'd rather just take a pill. And that is crazy that even the, you know, the number one cause of death in cardiologists is heart disease. And so that's where we need to start. And that's where I'm embarrassed and I'm doing everything I can. I've actually converted multiple cardiologists and other physicians over to plant-based diets and help, help them understand these lifestyle medicine concepts. And I'm never going to give up. I'm going to keep pushing until we finally get there because this is the state of nutrition right now in the United States. 63% of calories come from processed foods, added fats and oils, sugars, and refined grades more than half of our calories are nothing. There's no nutritional value to that whatsoever. Basically, they say we're overfed and undernourished. Only 12% of our calories are plant-based foods. And half of that plant-based food is potatoes from French fries and tomatoes from ketchup. Absolutely ridiculous. And then 25% of the standard American diet is animal-based food. So that's the state of, of, uh, of the nutrition in, in the United States. What I, I like this concept so much, talking about, again, the three food groups, the processed foods, like I showed earlier, animal foods and unprocessed plant-based. And I show people this and I say, you wanna take this green and you wanna increase it as much as you can, take this red and decrease it, eliminate the yellow. The blue zones, the longest living cultures in the world, ranged anywhere from 85 to 99% whole food plant-based, averaging somewhere around the mid 90% range of calories from fruits and vegetables, beans, lentils, whole grains, nuts, and seeds, unprocessed plant-based. That's where we need to be. And so this graph is a really nice way to kind of show that and, and emphasize to people, man, you need to take this green part of the pie graph and, and increase it as much as you can. So the current my plate in the USDA dietary guidelines, they show fruits and vegetables, grains, they still have dairy, which we're fighting so hard to remove. It's been removed in Canada's food guide, which I'll show you in a moment, but not yet in the United States. That's the big influence of the dairy industry. I'm so disappointed in, in the politicians and such for this. They put protein there, but really what they need to emphasize is plant protein, right? So this is the uh, proposed from PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, fruits, grains, whole grains, of course, vegetables, and legumes as the protein, and drink only water. That's the way it should be. And that is almost the way the Canada Food Guide is. They said, make water your drink of choice. They remove dairy as a food group. And they do say eat protein foods and they emphasized to eat predominantly plant-based proteins. They do show some animal-based proteins here, but when you read their guidelines, look, they're showing tofu, lots of beans, lentils, nuts. Uh, so they are emphasizing plant-based proteins. So this is a good step in the right direction. Now, remember, it is variable. Many people can eat a diet like this with some animal protein, some cholesterol saturated fat. And as long as they're avoiding all the processed foods, not smoking and exercising, many people can be free of heart disease for their life. Doesn't mean the animal foods are good for you. It just means some people can tolerate them and get a little bit lucky, right? Eating 100% plant-based is the, the safer, better way to go. But if you're somebody who has a big genetic risk of heart disease, if your cholesterol number is high, if you're overweight, if you already have plaque buildup, 
you don't want any animal product. You want to go 100% whole food plant-based. And it's so important to emphasize the whole food part. I tell people, eat the orange, don't drink the orange juice, eat the olive, don't drink the olive uh, don't drink the olive oil. Yeah, please don't drink the olive oil. Don't use the olive oil. And a lot of people are always like, oh, what about the protein? You got to watch the Game Changers documentary. I'll show you some athletes and uh, the protein is never a concern. As long as you eat adequate calories of unprocessed plant-based foods, you get all amino acids, you get all the protein you need. And if anybody ever questions you, if you're in the healthcare field, if you're talking to a friend or a family and they're like, oh, plant-based diet, protein, you're going to get nutrient deficient, blah, 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 all this stuff, whatever. Just say, that the American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is the longest nutrition, the largest nutrition organization in the world, has a statement that says appropriately planned vegan diets are healthful and nutritionally adequate for all stages of life, including pregnancy, lactation, infancy, childhood, adolescents, older adults, and athletes. All stages of life nutritionally adequate. That means all the macronutrients you need, including protein, all the micronutrients you need, all the vitamins and minerals. The one exception is B12, which is a whole different discussion. B12 comes from bacteria and you wash your vegetables, you wash it off. Animal-based foods are heavy in bacteria. You get B12, but you know what? The United States Preventative Services Task Force, if people bring up the, the B12 thing, you tell them, you know what? The big guidelines from the United States Preventative Services Task Force, USPFTF, they say all Americans should be on B12 if you're age 50 or older because absorption goes down over time. So it's something if you're over age 50, I should be taking B12 anyways. It's not like I have to take a supplement because I'm on a plant-based diet. We should all be taking it anyways because of how common B12 deficiency is over time as people hit over the age of 50. So B12 is not an issue. It's so easy to take a supplement. No big deal. And I'd rather do that than develop heart disease or stroke, right? And here's the example of the protein people who eat plant-based. There's This guy's featured in the Game Changers. It's pretty amazing. This guy ran the Appalachian Trail in 46 days, which is more than 50 something miles a day, every day, 46 consecutive days. It's, you know, check out the Game Changers. It's back on Netflix. Finally, I heard it was off for a while. It's back on Netflix. It is such a powerful way to learn about this. A James Cameron documentary, Arnold Schwarzenegger, lots of athletes, Olympians, and a very powerful way of explaining how important it is to eat plant-based for heart health. So moving on to emphasize, again, the power of this, there's this guy named Nathan Pritikin, who was one of the founders of lifestyle medicine. He had the simple statement, ah, all I'm trying to do is wipe out heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. That's it, right? And so this guy's got a pretty interesting story. Now, it's only an anecdote. We really shouldn't way too heavily on just one story, but his such an interesting story. He basically said, hey, I am going to uh, dedicate my life to this because he developed heart disease. He had very bad exertional angina uh, and he couldn't do much. He was debilitated. Went on a plant-based diet, changed his lifestyle, maintained a healthy weight, and his completely symptoms went away. And he said, he's very gutsy. He developed this big program called the, the, Pritikin, uh, the Pritikin program, uh, Pritikin Longevity Center. And he said, when I die, I want my autopsy to be published in the New England Journal of Medicine so people can see what my arteries look like. And that's gutsy, right? How does he know? They didn't have all the imaging back then like we did. He was back in the 70s, I believe. And he died of leukemia, which was pre-existing before his heart disease issue it eventually progressed and he died of leukemia. And this is what his autopsy showed, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, 1985. He had some yellow flat streaks, but no elevated plaques, no major blockage, and no reduction of the lumen. So no narrowing of the flow was found. No heart attacks of any size, no other findings referable to vascular disease. In a man 69 years old, the near absence of atherosclerosis and the complete absence of his effects are remarkable. And he was doing this for years and years and years, decades, uh, reversing his heart disease. Now that's just one story, but let's take it the next step further. Dr. Dean Ornish, he did publish the Lifestyle Heart Trial in a huge medical journal, Lancet in 1990. And he took people and got them on a plant-based diet. They had coronary clogging. He had one group where they just did usual care for their cardiologist. Another one into his program, which was whole food, plant-based, low fat, exercise, meditation, love and support was another part he put in there. And it showed that when only big blockages were analyzed, the average percentage of blockages actually decreased if you were on the Ornish program eating plant-based, but they progressed if you were in the control group one year after the angiogram. These angiograms were sent to an independent lab in Texas, blinded the people who interpreted them, had no clue which group these patients were in. Then he repeated it again five years later. But after one year, it was very clear that there was regression. So five years later, he did the same thing. They repeated the angiograms, which are, it's an invasive test. And what did he end up finding? There was even more regression of 
coronary artery disease. And this is what happened with the monkey and the rabbit, right? You clog them up, put them back in the natural environment, they reverse their disease. Now it's shown in humans. We essentially have the cure for America's number one killer right here. It's lifestyle, it's plant-based, it's exercising, avoiding tobacco. We got it. They showed some great examples of reversal of disease. This is just the only intervention here. It's not a stent. It's just diet. Went from a severely diseased, rattled, rattled out, uh, left anterior descending widowmaker artery to a completely normal artery with diet alone. Here is a nuclear stress test perfusion scan, a huge area of the heart not getting enough blood flow. Just three weeks later of a plant-based diet, suddenly all the flow is not quite all the flow, but almost all back, all just because the inflammation subsided and the cholesterol numbers went down, all from just diet. Absolutely amazing. So it really works and is very well validated. So there's the, there's the main finding there. So, so then um, this led to, and I, whenever, again, whenever you're talking about this to other people, when you're thinking about heart disease, plant-based diets, it's important to understand the uh, eat as little cholesterol and saturated fat as possible, according to the National Academy of Medicine, number one, number two, it's super important to understand that you can tell people that the American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics says 100% plant-based diet is nutritionally adequate, like we said. And here's another thing. The American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology Guidelines for the primary prevention of heart disease, trying to prevent the first heart attack or the first stroke, they say straight out a plant-based diet is recommended. It's in the guidelines. So nobody could ever fight me back before. This was in the guidelines in 2019 and I was preaching plant-based diets. I had pushback from colleagues. No, eat a Mediterranean diet, eat a Mediterranean diet, it's fine. Like, well, you know what? No, Mediterranean diet has never been shown to prevent heart disease. Let me say that again. The Mediterranean diet has never been shown to prevent heart disease with a little asterisk, with the exception of if you eat less meat on it, if you eat what's called a pro-vegetarian Mediterranean style diet, there was this big clinical trial called the PREDIMED trial. And when they reanalyzed the post hoc data, only the patients who had less meat in their diet, four servings or less, actually had a reduction in heart disease. When you looked at that trial, the composite endpoint of heart attack, stroke, or dying overall improved, but that was driven because stroke was reduced, driven largely by the reduction of stroke in a Mediterranean diet, but there was no significant improvement over a controlled diet for mortality or heart attack if you ate a Mediterranean diet. Only when they analyzed it further, only people on a Mediterranean diet that ate a lot less meat. So a vegetarian or almost vegetarian Mediterranean style diet did reduce the risk. But again, no animal product is really needed and any amount can raise your numbers. So get as close to 100% plant-based as you can. And I love this statement. This is a guy who I admire quite a bit named Dr. Kim Williams, past president of the American College of Cardiology. I worked with him at Rush University for a couple of years. Uh, and he basically says, the way he puts it is, a whole food plant-based diet is a cure for heart disease. If you're a cardiologist and you don't tell your patient about the cure for their disease, that is medical malpractice because you are actively withholding a cure from your patient and you can't do that. You cannot withhold a cure from your patient. And another statement that he made, which is powerful, is there are two types of cardiologists, vegans and those who have not yet read the research. And that was a little, you know, it stirred it up a little bit. But then again, as people started reading the research, they realized how true it really is. And uh, get people to change your diet and promote it more as physicians. So I think about when we're in medical school, where we take this whole Hippocratic oath, first do no harm, right? Well, we're doing a lot of harm if we don't promote this as the primary treatment for prevention and you know reversal even of heart disease. We really need to emphasize this. And we think about the Hippocratic oath. And the Hipp 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 Hippocrates also said, a lot of people don't realize this, let food be thy medicine and let the medicine be thy food. Well, that's what we should be doing. This dude was like 2000 years ago. He knew what he was talking about. Why are we not doing this now? And again, it's culture and money, along with some other issues that are bringing this on. So really, I emphasize whenever I give a talk to the, the general public, that you need to help be the change. You really need to help because it's going to take a group effort to help push this forward. What I always say is, first of all, you got to be healthy yourself, right? If you don't take care of yourself, eat healthy, stay thin, exercise, do the right things, nobody else is going to listen to you about it. 
So focus on your own health, get yourself on a plant-based diet, learn about this, study it, read about it. Remember, you are the change. Speak up, demand change. You actually speak with your dollar, right? What you buy really makes a big difference. So really push hard for this and be a good example. And the one thing that you can know and you can learn is that you too have the power to save people's lives. Even if you're not a doctor in the healthcare industry, if you promote this message, you literally can save people's lives. It's such an important thing. Everybody needs to speak up and really push this forward. So really kind of to summarize and go through a few uh, ending comments here, what of course we're trying to do is shift from pills to plants, makes a lot of sense, right? Let the food be thy medicine from the pharmacy with a PH to the pharmacy with an F. And you may have known this guy named Dr. Michael Greger. He says, and I like to emphasize this too, because a lot of times people get it and they want to go on a plant-based diet for their health and they understand the science, they understand it's, it's the best thing, but they still have a hard time doing it because of their human instincts, their cravings for sugar, salt, and fat, because of our cultural influences and all the marketing in the industry, their home situation, whatever their stressor is that they have, it's still hard to do. So frequently it requires an extra motivation. What else can we do to motivate somebody to stick to the proper diet? And Dr. Michael Greger says, the most ethical diet just so happens to be the most environmentally sound diet and just so happens to be the healthiest diet, a plant-based diet. And so I do frequently talk with my patients about the ethical side of our food system and the environmental impact on it. And it really hit me to do this. Initially, I didn't for a while. I'm like, I don't know, I'm going to talk about health only. It's the science. There's enough data alone just to really emphasize this just for the health. I mean, it's in the guidelines, right? But I still saw people struggle and struggle and struggle. And they frequently needed extra motivation. And it hit me once I was at the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine in Washington, D.C. It's a great conference done by uh, PCRM. It's going to be this August. I'm going to speak there as well. And I was sitting next to this pulmonologist and he was like, yeah, man, you know, sometimes we were talking about, you know, slaughterhouses and animal agriculture and all these things. And he said, sometimes when I want somebody to stop smoking, the American Lung Association tells us, show them pictures of charred lungs and huge tumors and people on oxygen and smoking through a tracheostomy and all these kind of gory pictures that you don't really want to see. But when you see it, you go, oh my gosh, ah, and it kind of once you see it, you can't unsee it, right? And then it ends up helping to motivate people to stop smoking. Well, I have a lot of patients that want to eat plant-based, but they're so addicted to the animal foods or their spouse won't change or whatever it ends up being. So I tell them, you need to watch some videos on animal agriculture and learn about what happens there. And maybe that'll give the motivation, the ethical side, really understanding how horrific it is. And the ethics behind all this is pretty, pretty crazy. Nothing too graphic, don't worry. But it is just absolutely mind-blowing. I try to get them to watch The Dominion, which is um, you know free on YouTube. And it all talks about animal agriculture and the ethics. And I also, sometimes I have religious people. And there's different religious arguments back and forth about food and all this stuff. And I just kind of keep it as simple as saying, hey, listen, man, no religion mandates meat eating. None of them do. None of them mandate it. And if you think about it, no matter which God you believe in or what religion you're in, the human body has been scientifically shown to be able to thrive on a 100% plant-based diet. There is no need to consume any animal-based food for any nutrient, right? We can live on a 100% plant-based diet. That's the way that God, whatever your God is, made us. God also made animals to the point where they can feel pain and suffer and joy and want to live their life, right? So when you choose to eat an animal-based food, you are choosing to cause pain and suffering and harm to a sentient being that your God made for what purpose? For your pleasure only. It's not for nutrition. You don't need to eat animal-based foods. It's for your pleasure because your culture told you to, and you think you need to eat it for protein. That's it, but you don't. So it's for your pleasure only. And a lot of people choose a vegan diet for ethical reasons, which isn't always healthy, right? We want whole food plant-based but they do so because they don't want somebody else to suffer just for their pleasure. And so that is uh, powerful. Watch the dominion and my daughter loves pigs. And so I just had to show a picture of a cute pig. <laughs> and then of course, when we think about the environmental destruction that animal agriculture causes, think about in this whole religious analogy, God made the earth, right? And by eating an animal-based diet, we are destroying the planet, the earth that God created by eating plant-based you're not doing that. So really, 
you need to focus on the plant-based diet for all these different reasons, which is that extra motivation that sometimes people need. The health motivation isn't just enough for some people. So uh, that pretty much sums up um, my presentation here. Um, and I really hope that you learned something. I know we went down through the basics. Uh, hopefully some of those powerful stories can drive in some of these concepts, how important it is to start early in your life with focusing on all these things. And I'd be happy to stick around and, and take some questions. And thank you very much, doctor. Appreciate that amazing presentation. Um, we are now going to begin our live q and I'll be asking questions as well as opening up questions to the audience to allow them to, to answer them. But before we begin, um, we'd like to make sure that everybody knows how to connect with you and learn more about you. Oh, sure. Great. Yeah. Um, there's a different, a bunch of different ways you can connect with me. I'm on Twitter. It's uh, at Steve Loam. Uh, this is a website, uh, pbnm.org, plant-based nutrition movement. This was a nonprofit organization that I founded uh, a few years ago and um, subsequently have turned it over to Merrill Fury as the uh, the CEO. They're doing lots of great things, uh, lots of different food events, lectures, potlucks, uh, and such. It's predominantly based in the Chicagoland area, but there is a lot of virtual events as well. They're doing a lot of healthy eating uh, for kids and trying to fight childhood obesity. Uh, this is a great organization. I'm not as involved with this anymore, but check it out. And if you undergo to the resource section on this website, there is so many great resources there. Uh, there's, you know, books, recipes, videos, food delivery groups, Facebook groups, you know, vacations you could take, smartphone apps, every resource you ever will need. We worked really hard to put together the plant-based resources in one spot here. So check that one out. Uh, heartstrong.com is still kind of in development. It's one of my other websites. It, um, it's kind of a step-by-step -step program. It just gets people to eat more and more and more plant-based. Uh, I'm still working on it and hopefully it's still, it's technically completed, but there's so many things I want to do with it. Uh, it's hard. I have six kids who are hundred percent plant-based by the way. So is my wife, who's a physician who's hundred percent plant-based and um, being the medical director over here and the chair of the cardiovascular division, of the hospital, lots of other things. It's, it's a challenge to, to do all these extra efforts, but I do all I can. And I hope uh, to make HeartStrong a more powerful resource for people as a kind of do-it-yourself lifestyle medicine program, like a kind of like doing an Ornish lifestyle medicine program, but doing it yourself online. But again, it takes a lot of motivation and effort. So I have that. Yeah, Twitter is at Steve Loam. I'm on Instagram a little bit. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, uh, which my kids really, um, really want me to get more active on YouTube. Um, I think I have like 13,000 subscribers. Uh, and um and put some good videos out there. I have the recent one about uh, the events of the marathon and trying to use that again as a tool to get people to understand that prevention is more important. It's great to learn uh, CPR, but focus on a plant-based diet for prevention. That's way more important. Great. Thank you for sharing that information as well as that wonderful presentation that you just gave. So now we're going to begin our Q&A session. As I had just stated, uh, I will be asking questions as well as opening up the floor to the uh, to the public. Um, to ask questions as well. We don't take questions directly from chat. Instead, we ask that everyone virtually raise their hand if you're not sure how to do that. In Zoom, on the bottom toward the right, you're going to see a reactions button and you're going to click on that button and you'll see the raise hand function that is in the pop-up menu. You'll click on that and then your hand will be raised and we will do our best to, to answer the questions in the order that we receive them. Um, when it's your turn, we will unmute you and prompt you to state your name, where you are from, and ask your question. We will ask that everyone keep their questions brief and on topic. We will then mute you. In order to give everyone a chance to get their question answered, we won't be taking up follow. We won't be taking follow up questions. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'll uh, I'll ask the uh, the first question here. So um, a lot of it was heart disease, but. Um, what about, you know, with diabetes and all of that kind of stuff, uh, obviously is, impa is impacted by a plant-based uh, diet. Um, what should be our, uh, you know, ideal blood sugar level and how do you get it down? Yeah, no, great question. Great question. Yeah, diabetes, uh, a lot of people uh, think is one of the most, maybe the most, uh, besides cholesterol, uh, risk factor, important risk factor for heart disease development. 
Two thirds of diabetics die from heart disease, more than two out of three actually. So that needs to be the biggest focus. Uh, and so eating plant-based for a diabetic is, is absolutely great. There's a lot of misconceptions. Uh, fasting blood sugar less than 100 is important. Hemoglobin A1C nice and low, at least under six, preferably lower than that would be even better. Now, I personally don't manage diabetes in my practice, but I do always talk uh, to my patients about plant-based diets. So frequently get into the diabetes discussions because a lot of misconceptions and they're like, oh, what about the carbohydrates? I eat beans, there's carbohydrates, it spikes my blood sugar, you get all these different things. And I say, well, listen, you know, in the short term, eating an apple might you know, spike your blood sugar a little bit because there's sugars, but that's the healthier sugars that's coupled with fiber. An apple a day keeps the doctor away, right? Beans, beans, good for your heart. So it's still good for diabetics as long as you're doing everything else right. You're keeping it low fat and plant-based and not eating refined carbohydrates or higher fat animal foods while you're at it. And again, what I always think is the most powerful thing to do whenever you're having any nutrition discussion is go to a major medical society's recommendation and tell them their statement. There is a statement from the American Diabetic Association that says if somebody follows a whole food, plant-based, low-fat diet, there is no need to ever count or restrict carbohydrates. You will still lose weight. Blood sugars and hemoglobin A1C will come down significantly. It's in the American Diabetic Association statement right there. Now, it's not the front and center recommendation. They still recommend their whole little eating plan with does have animal products in it, uh, counting your carbohydrates and doing all these complex things, but they do have a statement about the plant based about going on a 100% plant based diet which does not require you to count carbohydrates uh or anything like that there's no restrictions just keep it unprocessed keep it low fat as part of your presentation thank you for that as part of your presentation you mentioned going on um Dr. Esselstyn's diet for a little bit and I know that Dr. Esselstyn can be very strict specifically with regards to fats I know that um at least for a very long time he was against you know nuts and seeds and that types of things where do you stand as far as the, you know, the people who want to avoid getting sick? You know, he was dealing with a lot of patients who were, you know, had a severe heart disease. Yeah. People who are, aren't down that road that far, is avocado okay? Are nuts and seeds okay? Where, where I get these you questions, yeah, great questions. I get these questions a lot, actually. And so you're right. In his big initial uh, case series that he published and his follow-up series, these were people already had severe heart disease, right? And so he wanted to do everything possible, the strictest, strictest, strictest possible to make sure nothing ever raised their LDL cholesterol up and nothing ever damaged their endothelium. And nuts and seeds and avocado, they have some saturated fats. It can bump the LDL up. But what about somebody who's healthy and is just trying to prevent heart disease, they never had a heart attack or a coronary blockage. Really, the magic is in the numbers, right? So look at your LDL cholesterol number. If your LDL is under 70, whatever you're doing is fine. Uh, it's really hard to get it under 70 unless you are closer to the Esselstyn diet or closer to the Ornish diet, somewhat restricting the higher fat plant-based foods, but there is individual variability. So you can't just tell everybody, everybody's got to do this, everybody's got to do that. You got to know your numbers. And in my practice, I give my patients what we call a standing order to get their lipid profile drawn once a month so that they can change their diet, check it, change their diet, check it, change their diet, check it, and do it over and over again until they figured all the tweaks that they can do until they've reached a plateau. And they say, this is as far as I can go and with diet, then they know. Uh, and so it's just, so should, are avocados safe for me? Are, can I eat nuts and seeds? Uh, what about little bits of olive oil? Is that safe for me? That's 15% of uh, the fats in olive oil is saturated fats. It will raise your LDL a little bit, right? Well, if your LDL is under 70, whatever you're doing is fine. And your body's tolerating it fine from a cholesterol perspective. But usually to get the LDL under 70, most people have to really restrict the higher fat plant-based foods. So many times it's okay it's just a matter of you got to know your numbers and restrict it down to the point where you get your LDL under 70. And everybody's different too in regards to their tolerance. Uh, you know, some people be like, hey, my LDL is 90. I'm fine with that. At least it's not 150. At least it's not, you know, 125 like the average American. I'm going to have some nuts and seeds and avocado and keep my LDL 80 or 90. And that's not ideal. But as long as they're not smoking, they're exercising, they're thin and everything else is fine, you know, there's a good chance they'll be okay. So if though if there are plants such as these higher fat plants that they mentioned that maybe should be avoided in certain cases, how about things with regard going back to the sugar topics like as like potatoes, sweet potatoes, squash, and or other plants that may contribute to uh, to raising blood sugar? Yeah. So great question again. So what about whole unprocessed plant foods that are lower in fiber, higher in carbohydrates, um, such as potatoes and such? Well, so a couple things about that. 
Uh, number one, the problem with potatoes is always the company that keeps most people have French fries or they fry their potatoes or they put sour cream or butter or cheese all over them, right? So if you're talking only potatoes with no added fat, it is completely fine. There will be a very small subset of people, maybe the brittle diabetics, uh, the people who just really have a ton of insulin resistance um, genetically that might have some issues with spiking and such with it. But honestly, if you are overweight and you're trying to lose weight, eating um, potatoes are very helpful because they're very filling. Uh, they have a high satiety index. And if you keep them fat free, it'll help to keep you full while keeping it low fat and stay physically active. You'll end up losing weight and your insulin resistance will get better despite eating a more uh, carbohydrate rich food like a potato. And then the other thing to think about a uh, great example is the Okinawan diet, which was 65% sweet potatoes, no fat added, right? In America, we put butter and marshmallows on our sweet potatoes, not the Okinawans, just sweet potatoes. And 25% was white rice, which we usually don't like. So 90% of their calories were sweet potatoes and white rice, very high carbohydrates, relatively higher, not very high, but relatively higher on the glycemic index. They didn't have diabetes. They were thin. They were physically active. Their diabetes rates were near zero right? And so it's okay to eat the potatoes if they're fat-free and everything else in your diet is good and also low in fat. Uh, that's always the key. Um, I think that was your whole question, right? Yeah, you, yeah, you got it. I'm just going to ask one more question before I turn it over uh, and ask, uh, I, I get a question from the audience, which is you mentioned rice, brown rice, which is, you know, preferred over white rice. But now Michael Greger talks about brown rice having arsenic in it. Yeah, I believe so I was, that. So I, I believe that was... Um, my understanding is that's the arsenic, that's the rice that was going to Florida and had to do with, um, I forget something like the cotton fields that used to be down there and they used to use arsenic to- um, As a pesticide. It. Yeah, pesticide, right? So it's in the soil. Uh, if you get California brown rice, hopefully that won't be the case. And even with rice, it's a little bit more calorie dense. It's not like you should be eating huge, huge amounts. So, I mean, a little arsenic, eh, no big deal, right? But you just don't want to have a lot of it. Try to get California rice, keep it organic. So therefore, hopefully- um, you know, you won't have anything too harmful in it, but heart disease risk, um, there's not a lot of data on arsenic and heart disease. So at least I could say from my perspective, it shouldn't affect your heart risk, cancer risk and other issues. Yeah, I'm not sure. But my understanding has always been get your brown rice from California farmers. And then that concern isn't really there anymore. All right, great. So our first, uh, audience question is going to come from David. David, please state your name, where you're from and your question. Yes, my name is David. I'm from the Washington, D.C. area. And thank you so much for taking my question. I really appreciate this presentation. When it concerns um, assessing your heart health, my understanding is it's not LDL so much that's important, but either <clears throat> getting the particle size of LDL or oxidized LDL is more important, as well as fibrinogen, homocysteine, LPA, and triglycerides, as well as distinguishing between soft calcified plaque and hard calcified plaque, where the soft calcified plaque is more dangerous. And that's what you should be more concerned about rather than total cholesterol. I'm curious to know what you think. Yeah, so that's a great question. So, so the, currently the way the clinical trials have been set for decades and the way they've been following is LDL cholesterol. And like we spoke in the, uh, in the presentation, the prerequisite is, uh, of developing plaque has always been focused on LDL cholesterol and another thing called apolipoprotein B. These other markers, these LDL particle sizes, HDL particle sizes, um, they certainly have been shown that if you have a, an abnormal profile, smaller particle sizes of LDL, you're more likely to develop atherosclerosis. As of now, though, when the reason those types of tests, you may have heard of Berkeley Heart Labs, Boston Heart Labs, Cleveland Heart Labs, uh, they all measure these big complex panels for you. There really is not enough scientific data, clinical trials and research to advocate any specific intervention if your LDL particle sizes are small, or if your lipoprotein little a is elevated, uh, if these other parameters that you mentioned, fibrinogen, if they're wrong, what do you do about it, right? You're supposed to eat healthy, exercise, plant-based diet, don't smoke, stay thin, control your LDL, control your blood pressure, all those things anyways, right? There is no, oh, if your lipoprotein little a is a little high, do this, do that. No, there is no specific therapy. They tried niacin, niacin lowers lipoprotein little a, doesn't prevent heart attacks and strokes. And the thought is it only lowers it by a small amount, not enough to have a significant impact. 
um, plant-based diets. Baxter Montgomery in Texas actually did a little um, publication on plant-based diets and lipoprotein little a showing that if you change it, you can drop your lipoprotein little a by 15%. But many people's numbers are 300 when normal is less than 75. So 15% is not going to get you anywhere near the normal range. And so these complex parameters that we measure, a lot of these other things, the biggest criticism, and they're not, it's not in the guidelines, American Heart Association guidelines for, for prevention does not necessarily advocate measuring these because there's no change in our treatment plan based on the current clinical trials and evidence that we have, even if your particle sizes are off or your lipoprotein little a is elevated. Now there is things coming in the pipeline. Of course, what's it gonna be? It's gonna be pharmaceuticals, right? But what a lot of people would say is, if you're eating plant-based, exercising, not smoking, staying thin, even if your lipoprotein little a is high, your fibrinogen is off, your particle sizes are off, you're doing all the right things within your control and very likely you're going to be fine and not have any issue. In those instances, when you have a higher risk profile based on the Cleveland Heart Labs or Berkeley Heart Labs, make sure you're seeing your doctor, getting things checked out, consider calcium scoring. Um, if you have any symptoms, get on a treadmill, get things checked out, focus on the prevention, but make sure you're also being very aware of things and, and getting things checked out closely. All right. So give me one second here. I got to just find, there we go. So uh, our next question is going to go to Mark. Mark, you're going to state your name, where you're from, and ask your question. Great. Thank you very much. Mark Ferris from uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, great presentation, Dr. Lum. I thoroughly enjoyed your uh, your stories. Why, uh, two questions. Why is there so much confusion around diet when you've got proliferations of things like paleo and keto, which you know, just kind of muddies the water. And then secondly, do you have any other advice for like older, like I'm turning 60 this year and any advice um, on any other supplements or anything that we need to do as we age? Yeah, great questions. Great questions. First of all, you're not old. You're still a young guy. 60 <laughs> is, is still considered young. So, um, and it's great that you're here and you're going to stay young, hopefully for a very long time, because you're, you're really uh, focusing on the right thing. So the first question uh, being, why is there so much confusion when you hear about paleo diets and you hear about keto diets and all these other things? And again, it's culture and money, right? Culture is, our culture in America loves animal-based foods, high-fat foods, and, and instincts. Our brain loves high-fat foods. So paleo diets and keto diets really appeal to that in our American culture. So people want to hear this. They want to hear good news about their bad habits that they can eat bacon or they can eat you know, high-fat animal-based foods because it stimulates their pleasure center in their brain. That's the way they were raised. And those diets, the keto and the paleo, they restrict all processed foods. So any diet that restricts all processed foods is gonna be healthier than the way most Americans eat. And so when you look at you know tons of anecdotal stories, oh, I lost weight on a keto diet and I lost weight on a paleo diet and I feel so much better and all these things. So that's great, those are anecdotes, right? We're not supposed to use those. What does the science show? What do the clinical trials show? And the clinical trials have very strongly failed to demonstrate that a paleo diet lowers heart disease risk. And just the same with the keto diet. The, uh, the keto diet studies are very short-term. It's not well tolerated. There's lots of side effects. Actually, my next YouTube video I have been working on for a couple of months now is, is talking about the keto diet, how it's been ranked the lowest, 24 out of 24 by US News and World Report in regards to the heart healthiest diet. They ranked 24 diets. Keto was dead last. 24 out of 24 for heart risk. Cholesterol numbers can go up. It's high fat, high saturated fat. No matter how you end up doing, oh, eat more plant-based keto. Well, you know what? Guess what? It hasn't been studied long-term. That's not what the blue zones, the longest living cultures ate. They didn't eat that way, but people love to hear this. They love to hear good news about their bad habits. You can lose weight on it. There was another big recent publication that actually showed that keto significantly increases infl inflammation markers, which is a that's bad because that's one of the big components to heart disease. And so there's a lot of money in it. A lot of doctors will sell supplements. They'll try to get YouTube followers by just spreading good news about your bad habits to most Americans. And people want to hear something that's against the established, uh, established medical community. So that's why I always advocate only get your information from big major medical societies. There is no, no medical society that advocates a keto diet or a paleo diet no cancer organization, no heart organization. And I love to tell the story when people ask about the paleo diet. And I say, there was this guy who said he was paleo before paleo was a thing in the 1970s. He followed a paleo diet. He's been very strict on it for decades. And he had a heart attack and a stent put in, and his name is Bernie Sanders. 
And I actually made a YouTube video with the message to Bernie Sanders a few years ago when that happened. And I said, listen, man, you got to do what Bill Clinton did. Go on a plant-based diet. You know, you're all big into the environment and the Green New Deal that he's working on. Well, you, that's, you need to be plant-based. You have heart disease. You need to be plant-based for that. You know, he's funding, he's giving all this funding to the dairy industry and all these things to help bail them out because all these plant-based milks are doing so good. And everybody's realizing they're not cows and they shouldn't be drinking cow's milk. And as that realization happens, the dairy industry fails, but they're trying to bail them out. No, come on, Bernie, don't do that. So I sent a pretty nice video. It's only about three minutes long. Uh, and actually he got to watch it. I actually got contacted by his campaign that he actually saw it. But of course, I don't know if that really changed anything if he's changed his diet, but hey, make it a little bit of an impact. So um so that's the whole question about the paleo and the keto. Don't do it. It's not recommended. The science doesn't support it. Short-term gains, easier to follow, uh, a lot of misinformation, but long-term, not good for your heart health uh, and definitely not, not good. So uh, the second thing you asked was about supplements and things. And honestly, um, there's two that are very clear. And then there's a couple that are a little bit murky in regards to the science. We always got to be very science-based and evidence-based. Uh, and the clear thing was a vitamin B12 we spoke about. Everybody over the age of 50 should take it. If you're on a 100% plant-based diet under the age of 50, you should also take it as well. Uh, that's important. The other thing is vitamin D, but only if your vitamin D level is low on a blood test. So it should be part of the routine blood work that you get every year or whatever. Uh, check your vitamin D. Now, other people talk about, oh, what about vitamin K2? What about, um, should we do iodine? Uh, how about omega-3s? And honestly, the science on those is very weak. Uh, it's not very strong. They're, we really want in our medical world, randomized controlled trials, taking thousands of people, trying this, and then trying placebo, which is fake, waiting and seeing who has heart attacks, who has strokes, what happens to them? Is there a risk to, to doing this therapy? And there really isn't enough real strong scientific data to make strong, good, firm recommendations for any other supplements. So we're doing our best guesses when it comes to some of these other things. And that's why you'll hear conflicting opinions about, should we all be taking, if you're on hundred percent plant-based diet, should we take it, be taking omega threes? Oh, or is flax seeds and chia seeds and hemp seeds, are those enough? Or those are short chain, but can we convert enough to long chain? There's all these questions and you'll see the back and forths between different plant-based doctors. Some recommend it, some don't. And honestly, the reason it's confusing is because there's no great answer. And um, so I just kind of say, if you wanted to, and you don't mind, I don't think it's going to be harmful to take an algae-based omega-3 supplement. It's not the end of the world to, you know, take something that has iodine in it and K2. Uh, you can overdose on K2, but just keep it low and have it every once in a while. And it's not going to be harmful if a person wants to, if they're okay with supplements. But, you know, i got a lot of patients like, dude, I don't want to take extra pills and supplements. No way. You know, if I can avoid it, then I don't want to take it. And that's fine. Then don't worry about it. And there's no great way to monitor. You could do omega profiles to see uh, how your omega-3 fatty acids are. So those could be done. So people are really concerned and want to check. Uh, I do those sometimes. We don't really routinely check iodine levels, but we do monitor thyroid function. Um, and the vitamin K2, there's really no good monitoring for that, honestly. So uh, it's really just B12, vitamin D if your levels are low. And if you wanted to take it as far as algae-based omega-3s, iodine, and K2, um, you could. But I don't push it on everybody. So um, something that I've seen is a little controversial, uh, specifically, uh, as a matter of fact, I, um, a few years ago during one of the, uh, the Real Truth About Health panels, uh, there was uh, T. Colin Campbell and I think a couple of the plant-based doctors and Dr. Kim Williams, and they were talking about uh, stents and statins. Yeah. Everyone was saying that they don't affect the 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 endpoints, right? They don't, the only endpoint that we really care about, which is, which is um, mortality. And um, Dr. Williams said, no, they actually do. They do, they do yeah. owe the chance. So what, yeah, I wanted to hear your opinion on that. Yeah. So the deal with statins is, of course- it's kind of it's kind of cheating in some senses, right? And that's why people who are in the pure lifestyle medicine world, you're like, hey, eat 100% plant-based, get your LDL down that way, stop the inflammation that way, uh, and then you won't need the statins, right? But you know what? A lot of people don't do the diet and they don't do it. And if they're eating foods that are high in cholesterol and saturated fat and pro-inflammatory, statins can knock the inflammation down and knock the cholesterol numbers down. They can be effective. Now, the reason, uh, of course, there's some side effects. They say anywhere between five and 20% of people could get muscle aches. 
Uh, but overall, the mortality is significantly reduced. You saw those the clinical trials I showed with that little line and the dots. Um, uh, almost every single secondary prevention trial, secondary prevention, which means you've already had a heart attack or stroke, you've already had a blockage, an aneurysm, statins have been shown to reduce mortality and events. Now, that's because these are sick people, they're higher risk. You only need to wait two or three years to see the benefit. Primary prevention trials, healthy people who've never had a heart attack or stroke or a blockage, to see the effect of a statin is going to take decades, right? Like I said, the sooner you get your LDL down in life, the better you're going to be. So if I have a 30-year-old person who comes to me and says, Doc, I eat McDonald's every day. I'm not stopping. I don't care. I weigh 300 pounds, but I'm not changing my diet. I can't get them the matter. I get them my hands and knees and I beg them and give them all the reason. Nothing. Won't change their diet. Their LDL is high. If I put that person on a statin and drop their LDL from 150 down to 50, over 20, 30, 40 years, it's going to have a marked reduction in risk of heart attack and stroke and clogging arteries if they continue their unhealthy lifestyle habits. But how do you measure that in a clinical trial? You don't do clinical trials for 30 years, right? These clinical trials are usually at most, you know, a few years. And so that's why the primary prevention data is lacking uh, because it's not long-term enough. But certainly uh, there is a benefit in the long-term. Now, I don't, you know, I am definitely somebody who pushes lifestyle first. And some other doctors get nervous. Somebody will come in, their LDL be 150, and they want to throw them on medications right away. And I said, well, do you want to try a lifestyle approach? And if they say, yes, I don't give them the statin. I give them an order for fasting lipid profiles every month. And I educate them. I give them resources. Or you have a local nutritionist who does all the plant-based stuff, everything they can. But then I say to me, I say to the guy, hey, listen, or the, or the gal, you already had a heart attack or a stroke or a blockage, man. This is super important to get this controlled. If you can't do it through diet after you check this once a month for the next three months, we got to do something to get your number down. And I don't want to give the medication, but it is still helpful. And there's other things out there too. There's there's a bunch of newer ones for path up, probably and everything. But I am still very much so trying to avoid it. But the reality is we're not there yet to where we can get everybody to just boom, plant-based diet and get their numbers down. I sure hope that day comes, but I do advocate statins whenever we need to. Even Esselstyn will put people on statins. If they're eating whole food, plant-based, oil-free, and their LDL is still 80 or 90, despite that, if they have real severe disease, he'll tell them to take a low dose just to get the LDL down to at least that less than 70 range. So it does, it does work. It's just harder to tease out the data and the side effects annoy people, of course, if it's there. But in general, it, it can be important. It's an important tool but nice to try to avoid. And, and many people just choose not to, and that's okay as long as they understand the risks and benefits. Okay, I'm gonna ask another question in the audience, but I wanna ask you one quick question that's sort of similar, we, um, but if you can just keep it short, which is stents. Do they prevent death in the long term of a person? Yeah, so I, I touched on that a little bit early in the presentation, and the answer is in stable people who are not having heart attacks, no, they don't prevent uh, heart attacks in the future, they don't make people live longer. During an active heart attack, when an artery is clogged and clotted off, a stent can be life-saving in that instance. But otherwise, no, lifestyle is way more powerful than stenting in stable disease. And there's a risk of complications, heart attack, stroke, and such from doing stents or bypasses. So we really, and it's, it's, been, it's been taken off pretty good where we've been really avoiding uh, over-stenting people nowadays. It's slowly catching up, but there's so much money in it. They make so much money doing stents. It's, it's a slow, slow process. Great. Uh, Susan, you're up next. Please state your name, where you're from, and your question. Hello. Uh, my name is Susan Frankel. I am from Chicago. And I loved your presentation. It was fabulous. Thank and you. home of, of Dr. Williams. Yeah. Um, so my question is focused on the role of exercise. So I am a 69 year old female, five foot five, 112 pounds. I've been on a whole food plant-based diet, salt, oil, sugar free, um, close to the, between Esselstyn and McDougal diet. Um, uh, back in February, I fractured my foot dancing. I oh. normally dance 12 hours a week. I am a very active person. Um, but since February, I've been unable to exercise and I've been wearing a boot. So flash forward two months to my annual lipid blood work came back. Um, two months later, my LDL went way up. Um, my triglycerides went up. I mean, it's still under, but it's not below 70. And could this be, could the lack of exercise be the cause of this? Because my diet is perfect. 
Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's a great question. And um, so a couple of different things I could, I'll talk about exercise in general real quick, and then talk about your specific situation. Maybe I'll do your situation first. If you gained weight because of lack of exercise, that will increase your LDL. Exercise in general reduces triglycerides and raises HDL. So lack of exercise will increase your triglycerides and will lower your HDL. So we do know that. Um, so certainly, yes, the lack of exercise will impact those things. And if you gained weight, the biggest impact of exercise on LDL is more with the weight. There's only a small percentage of people where pure exercise alone, independent of weight gain or loss, that exercise alone will lower your LDL cholesterol. Most of LDL lowering is dietary, not exercise induced. But if you exercise and it helps you to lose weight, simple weight loss has been shown, even if it's just your exercise to knock your LDL down. So uh, I think, you know, when you have an orthopedic injury, uh, most Americans I, who aren't eating as, as good as you are, I tell them it's even more important when you break your, your ankle or something that uh, if you're not exercising, you got to be even more strict with diet because you're going to gain weight if you continue your same diet and not being physically active. Um, but in your situation, since your diet is already so perfect, I would try to advocate doing anything else you can to stay active. There is actually arm ergometry machines where you take your arms and you pedal with your arms. Uh, you got to ease into it so you don't hurt your rotator cuffs or something, but there's other alternative ways to exercise, whether it's in the pool or whatever, try your best to stay as active as you can. The general recommendation for exercise, which again, uh, in the presentation said maybe 20% of heart health is exercise and most of it's food, but you want 30 to 60 minutes a day, five days out of the week of moderate intensity aerobic exercise. So two days you can rest, five days, you want 30 to 60 minutes, moderate intensity aerobic exercise, and then also two days of strength training. Now, it's a little controversial as to whether or not doing more exercise than that is good for your heart or not, like marathon running, like I do. There's a lot of research that shows marathon running actually calcifies your coronary arteries, uh, but when the plaque hardens, is that the type of plaque that really increases heart attack risk and such? Well, there's not a lot of good way to answer that question, but there's anecdotal stories like two marathon runners you know, having cardiac arrest right in front of you during your half marathon. So you never know what's going to happen. Um, there's both those runners have run marathons and they're very well-trained fit athletes. So um, probably the sweet spot is, is right there. 30 to 60 minutes a day, five days out of the week of moderate intensity. You can cut the minutes in half and make it vigorous intensity if you want, but also throw some resistance training, not big, heavy stuff. You don't need to squat 300 pounds and bench press like crazy, but simple strength training as well is very helpful. Thank you, doctor. Uh, our next question is coming from Evelyn. Evelyn, please state your name, where you're from, and your question. Hi, my name is Evelyn Costello. I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, you briefly mentioned uh, CRP, and so I have some questions about that. Uh, last year, I did a regular CRP test and came in at 8.3 on a range, a top range of 10.7 on the lab I use. But this year I did a high sensitivity CRP and came in at 3.8 and a top range of three. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm wondering about the difference in those uh, two tests and should I continue to do high sensitivity CRP? Um, I'm assuming that if I manage to lower my LDL, that my CRP will also go down because right now my numbers are LDL at 115, homocysteine at 9.4 on top range of 15, and triglycerides at uh, 124. Okay. Yeah. Great question. So first of all, C-reactive protein or CRP is an inflammatory marker, a little bit more specific for vascular and artery inflammation. If it goes up, your heart disease risk is higher. If it's nice and low, it's lower. Most of the recent clinical trials are focusing on the high sensitivity C-reactive protein. So I almost always, once you've had a high sensitivity test, I throw out and don't even think about the prior C-reactive protein testing. Just focus on what you have now in front of you, the high sensitivity result, which I think you said was 3.7, less than one is optimal. One to three is like average, okay. Over three is kind of concerning when it gets to be like 10 or higher. It's like, juice. there's a lot of inflammation going on. Now, remember, other things can raise C-reactive protein infections, arthritis, autoimmune disorders. It's not just heart disease risk. And it does not always come down just when the LDL cholesterol comes down. 
Now, when if your LDL cholesterol comes down because you shift your diet to more plant-based and more anti-inflammatory, then LDL will come down with your diet change and so will inflammation because a lot of times it's diet that is uh, causing the inflammation and driving up the C-reactive protein. There are a lot of individual variabilities. Some people gluten raises CRP or nightshades raises CRP, or it's, you know, mostly the animal-based foods that end up, or the processed foods that raise the C-reactive protein too much omega-6s compared to omega-3s. Uh, so trying to make all those tweaks and then following the high sensitivity C-reactive protein to see what you can do to get it down is important. It is less important if you're a primary prevention person, meaning never had a heart attack or stroke, focus on the eating healthy, focus on the LDL, don't worry as much about the C-reactive protein, especially if everything else is good. And if your calcium score remains zero, ah, don't worry too much about the C-reactive protein. But if you're not eating as healthy, if you've already had a heart issue or a vascular issue, you do want to really, really work hard to tweak your diet and find out what can drive that C-reactive protein down. And getting back to the statin question, there was one clinical trial. This is, this is why people don't believe in statins, right? One clinical trial called the Jupiter trial, which took healthy people, primary prevention, some people were diabetic in there and gave them, they had all had elevated C-reactive proteins. Half of them got rosuvastatin, half of them got placebo. The people on rosuvastatin C-reactive protein went down and their risk went down. Guess who funded the study? The company who maze, makes rosuvastatin and the company who makes the CRP test. So how biased is that? Oh, it sucks that that happens, but that's just the way it is. So yeah, focus on the diet, see what you can do depending on your category. Okay. And um, just a, a question for you, not not more of a logistical question. Um, our next speaker is running about five minutes late. Are we able to ask you questions for an additional five sure. minutes? Yeah. All right. Great. So um, what do you think about Ozempic for weight loss, the diabetic? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a big question nowadays. And I've thought a bit about it. I, you know, even I don't technically consider myself a weight loss expert. Uh, I don't see people for the primary reason of weight loss. Now, obviously I have a ton of people who are overweight or obese and I try to guide them as best as I can as focusing on their heart disease. I have never once in my career prescribed a weight loss drug and I don't think I ever will. Obviously the more powerful thing is, is diet uh, and, and lifestyle changes and it works better than any weight loss drug can. But like we have talked about because of all the barriers some people just can't change their diet no matter what. And they use the weight loss drugs as a tool to put them over the edge. Similar to weight loss surgery, Dr. Garth Davis, a big plant-based surgeon, you know, does weight loss surgery. And everybody's like, oh, you're a plant-based lifestyle guy. Why are you doing surgery? Shouldn't they just be changing their diet? And, and people who say that they don't really get the complexity, the psychological complexity of food addiction and all these barriers and how it is just so hard for individual people to change their diet as strict as some of you people here listening might be, it is really tough. And in those instances, I understand why people turn to weight loss drugs, but that's not really the right solution. I wish, again, there's a lot of profit in these drugs. That's why a lot of money goes into it. And really, if we were to put that much money into changing our diet as a culture, getting rid of processed foods and eliminating or reducing animal foods, we would have a better effect on overall public health and weight loss as a country than the few thousand individual people who spend thousands of dollars on Ozempic or other drugs. And the more big controversy, which I'm going to be a part of a discussion panel in ICNM, the conference in Washington, D.C. in August, is that the American Academy of Pediatrics is now advocating it in obese kids, not not Ozempic, but I believe it's Wegovy, a different one. Um, they're advocating giving weight loss drugs to kids instead of just stopping their sugar and getting them off the video games and have them run outside and play. And that's who that's controversial. I would never advocate that myself, but it's a complex situation. Yeah, that's that's sad. So, um, Alice, um, you're next. Please state your name, where you're from, and ask your question. Alice, I'm um, from California, and I'm um, thank you. And I'm motivated to change my lifestyle. Great. Her glycerols are so low at 79. The yellow third and my total cholesterol is 190. Why would my triglycerides be so low with everything else being high? Okay, you, you broke up a little bit, but I think what I heard you say is that your triglycerides are low, they're at 79. Uh, but your total cholesterol is 190. How are the triglycerides so low when the total cholesterol is high? 
Uh, so that total cholesterol is a little high. It's not crazy bad. Again, we like to shoot for less than 150, but total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol is really a completely different thing than uh, triglycerides. It's a completely different metabolic pathway. It's affected uh, a, quite a bit differently by dietary factors, um, more influenced by exercise. And so they're different. So we frequently see those types of variabilities. And there, again, there's a lot of genetic individual variability as well, um, where people see that. So it's, it's not a surprise. I'm not sure what your situation is, what your weight is. If you, um, you know, if you exercise regularly or not, if you're very physically active, your triglycerides will be low, but if you're not eating healthy, your total cholesterol will be high. Right. And I, you know, I see a lot of people who run marathons and they have great high HDLs and low triglycerides, but, uh, and their exercise is able to counteract their diet for the HDL and triglycerides but it's not able to counteract, of course, the LDL and the LDL still goes up and they can develop heart disease. So it's kind of a complex situation, but I would just say it's very common uh, and it's good that your triglycerides are low. Uh, if you move more plant-based, hopefully you can get that total cholesterol down and, and get that LDL cholesterol down to where it needs to be. Okay. Thank you for that. And actually our next speaker is ready now. So I wanted to thank you very much for your, your really amazing presentation. I, I really learned a lot personally, and I think the audience did too. And with that, I would like to have, um, I'd like to uh, open up the mics and let the audience share their gratitude for, uh, for giving such a, a wonderful presentation. So if we can open up the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you. 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 Thank you.